Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Philpot. I am the food and agriculture correspondent for Mother Jones. And um, I just can't say how excited I am to be moderating this panel, um, you know, asking some fundamental questions about the future of our food system, but possibly more importantly, coming up with some answers to the huge challenges that we're facing. The panel is called Bugs and Kelp feeding our post-pandemic planet. Um, and, you know, obviously this panel was queued up last year. We had meetings going into it. Uh, we were really excited about it. Um, and, you know, even at that time, even, you know, more than a year ago when we were planning this, the, the, the uh, challenges facing the food system seem daunting. Um, as everyone knows, population is uh, set to reach 9 billion within 20 or so years. Um, and um, at the same time, um, massive challenges from climate change just keep manifesting themselves um, in the United States and all over the world. Um, and then this sort of black swan event um, hit in um, late 2019, early 2020, this pandemic that disrupted the food supply, um, caused all manner of disruptions uh, throughout society, killed you know, hundreds of thousands of people um, and at the same time, all of the insults of climate change just kept coming, just kept mounting up. Um, brutal fires in California, um, a really, really active and destructive hurricane season. Um, and so now we have to think about the specter of global pandemic um, on top of the various um, challenges of climate change. And I've got to say, um, this pandemic is exposing a lot about the fragility of our food system and various points in the supply chain. And it's very unlikely to be the last one. I, I did a piece um, in, uh, you know, sometime in the middle of 2020 about how scientists are, there's a lot of scientists who study flu influenza. And there is a lot of research suggesting that the global pork industry, the way that hogs are stuffed together in confinements, um, you know, mainly here in the United States and in China, um, give rise to a lot of opportunity for the evolution of, um, of flu pathogens that can jump from back and forth between people and pigs uh, in a way that is very dire and scary. Um, and we also know that the ongoing destruction of wild spaces is limiting the range of wildlife and um, creating um, more and more opportunities for wildlife and people to interact in ways that, um, that can give rise to cross species um, jumping up pathogens. And so I think it, it's, it's pretty clear that this black swan event that hit, hit us in 2020 um, is probably something that is going to happen again, um, you know, in, in the near future, you know, it, it, it's quite likely. We haven't even gotten this one under control. Um, and so um, with these challenges in mind, we've assembled this panel of people who are working on alternative proteins, um, alternative um, ways of doing agriculture, ways that haven't, um, that aren't necessarily new in the world, but are fairly new uh, in the West, in the sort of global North. Um, and, um, and, you know, there are some taboos around some of them, like, you know, the, the consumption of insects, but, you know, we don't have to think about insects as something that we consume. Um, we're comfortable with, um, we were already feeding our livestock things that we would never consume. We feed, um, we literally feed cows chicken litter, uh, litter from, um, you know, confined uh, uh, chicken operations. And so feeding chickens bugs probably shouldn't bother us. Um, and so on our panel today, we've got Carrie Rupp, who is a partner in True Wealth Ventures. Um, hello, Carrie. I'm very Hi. excited to be talking to you today. We've got Mohammed Ashur, the CEO of Aspired Food Group. Um, and known for their consumer brand EXO or EXO. Um, and we have Liz Kustos, the CEO of EnviroFlight, which is a company that I've written before in the past um, in the context of uh, soldier flies. Uh, 
this was a panel that was assembled last year, queued up and ready to go, and then rudely interrupted by the um, by the pandemic with the canceling of last year's uh, South by Southwest meeting. And so, um, I want you, I wonder if we could start by getting you guys to comment on, you know what you were, how you were thinking about pitching or uh, sort of talking about your projects uh, last year going into the festival and how the pandemic changed things. And I'll give a start to start with a tiny bit of context on who I am and what my projects are. So yes. uh, we are a seed stage venture capital fund based in Austin, actually, um, focused specifically on women led companies that are improving human and or environmental health. And the, the thought process behind that is that um, not only do women led companies outperform financially, but that women are actually in the US making 85% uh, of consumer purchase decisions, they're making 80% of healthcare decisions for their family. And they tend to be choosing uh, cleaner, greener, healthier solutions for their families. And so we think that they ought to be on the leadership team of the companies that are producing those products because they're going to bring a great perspective of their customer in terms of product design, you know, marketing, sales, et cetera. And we think that the acquirers in these sectors are having to find new up and coming innovations that are cleaner and greener to meet the needs of both, you know, the millennial consumers in general and also just their women consumers who are really looking, I think, uh, more so than other uh, market segments really at these clean and green solutions. So that's literally our financial thesis is by investing in women who are doing these clean and green things, we will actually make more money um, from a capitalist point of view because the market actually is demanding these things that are also better for the world. So it's impact, but it's not concessionary impact. It's impact that actually is just increasing the value because of the, of the importance of it to so many consumers in this country. So for us, we are invested specifically in a kelp company called Atlantic Sea Farms uh, based out of Maine. Um, one of the things that's pretty innovative about that company is that they um, basically control the supply chain through. So they actually help with strain selection to choose which seeds they think are gonna be most viable to produce great kelp, work with a lobster fishermen to repurpose their skill set and their equipment in the off season to actually put the kelp on the line and grow the kelp and then create products for, from that kelp, both you know kelp vegetable, um, but also seaweed salad, kimchi, et cetera, and actually sell into <laughs> before the pandemic, both food service and retail and, you know, potentially ingredients. Um, we're in some other companies that may come up over the course of today, but I don't want to dominate too much of the conversation. Um, but one of the things obviously is that we've been looking at alternative proteins, other sustain. So we, because we're looking at both health and sustainability, a lot of times those times those overlap in, in food. So kelp is actually a superfood. It's one of the best sources for us for iodine, but also magnesium and, magnesium and calcium. But we actually invested in it from a sustainability angle and that not only does it not need land, fertilizer, um, fresh water, it actually makes the ocean around it less acidic and actually makes the, you know, shellfish around it more, you know, healthier, et cetera. So it's a really like very powerful sustainability play, but it also has a health play that's relevant. And I think that's true for a lot of the innovations we're going to talk about here um, today, which is super compelling because there's no, we're giving up this for this. <laughs> we're just getting a lot of benefits. And, and to your point earlier, Tom, and maybe it's something that hasn't been traditional in the U.S., uh, but, you know, people have been eating seaweed in other cultures for, you know, probably thousands of years. And frankly, it got hot. And I think it was the rolling into 2020 before all this stuff hit. Seaweed was a top food, you know, trend in like the New York Times and, you know, Whole Foods, et cetera. A lot of people's kids have been eating, you know, chewy seaweed snacks, which have been dehydrated. And all of a sudden now we have this U.S. based source of fresh kelp that can scale uh, by getting more and more of these fishermen to actually start producing it. So. All that to say, I think we have already, we were already interested in these trends around how do we start feeding the planet with more sustainable, healthier foods that are going to meet the demands of the consumers. What's been interesting about all the disruptions this year is how much more important people are finding both of those topics. Obviously, health is top of mind just because all of a sudden it's on everyone's mind. And how do you make sure that you're, you know, in a position to beat this pandemic, but also that um, finding ways that we're going to get local food to people um, that we can actually be self-sufficient as a, you know, maybe if it has to be as a country for now because of, you know, supply chain disruptions, um, but also the resilience over the long term of having food that's actually going to be viable for the planet, I just think has become all the more important um, than actually food waste and, you know, and, and getting that 
potentially good still food back into the supply chain. We have an investment in that space. It's just becoming all the more important. Um, and we can talk about the details of that later, but I think it just doubled down and emphasized the, the relevance of this topic um, over the course of the last year. And, and Terry, I'm just really curious about how the pandemic affected like superfoods of 2020. You know, suddenly there, it's a much different 2020 than anyone uh, who was writing those articles knew was going to happen. How did that impact, how did the pandemic impact the status of kelp? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is we, there was a risk, of course, that it was going to be this hot new thing that wasn't interesting anymore because, you know, there's just more fundamental things of like, how do I just get food at home and how do I feed my family? Uh, what shifted for Atlantic Sea Farms became completely the channel. So we were actually selling into uh, restaurants and actually had like a big global, <laughs> or not global, but national sweet greens, you know, dish that went out and we were in legal seafood, et cetera. And then restaurants shut down completely for months. And that was where most of the supply was going. What's interesting is because it is a healthy food that's novel and actually is of interest to people both in an e-commerce setting and in the grocery store is that all of a sudden retail just took off. They actually are, you know, grocery stores are in a really unique position right now because while it's been really challenging from a supply chain point of view, so many people are eating at home and grocery stores have become, you know, the topic of national conversation. And so they're all looking for differentiation. They're looking for things to get people into the store, get, getting them shopping. And so actually we're finding, we got to, a nationwide rollout in sprouts that happened um, this month. We're actually now by coastal and whole foods and, and expanding categories because of this need for healthy new topics to get actually, you know, customers to decide where they're going to shop and what they're going to shop for. Um, we wouldn't have necessarily expected that, but I think actually this healthy food product that's, you know, um, unique is actually a really interesting differentiator for grocery stores right now. Got you. Mohamed, I wonder if you could um, tell us a little, bit of, a little bit about what you do and then um, tell us how the pandemic has shaken it up. Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I co-founded Aspire about seven years ago and I was at the time, you know, a medical student studying to become a neurosurgeon. I didn't expect that I was going to, you know, within a few months be thrust into a global business competition that would have me re-question not necessarily the end goal, which is, you know, serving people, but, but the means that are most optimal to do that. Um, and I think what happened was by kind of being exposed to the Holt Prize competition and, and learning about this global problem of food insecurity and understanding how interconnected our global food supply chain was, um, it became really clear to me that we have really two significant food problems in the world that are almost in a sense opposites of each other. You have on the one hand countries where people have an extraordinary burden of malnutrition, where there's insufficient access to food that is safe, affordable, and, and healthy. And then on the other hand, you have other countries which have almost the opposite problem. We're over consuming calories from food and livestock that are either harming our bodies, harming our planets. Um, and, and now you have this sort of double burden of morbidities that are contradictory where you can have in the same planet people who go to bed hungry at night and who are starving and at the same time people who are morbidly obese with like real you know issues with diabetes etc so realizing that our global food system was interconnected we realized that you know it's important to also look at the broader trends you know we're seeing that there's a huge affinity for people to go back to what is natural what is free from what is you know um minimally processed um as opposed to necessarily foods that you know don't have a lot of history of, of human consumption and of course you know in the midst of all that we came across insects as a really potentially exciting viable candidate because as it turns out, insects are the oldest form of protein humans have ever consumed. Um, it's obviously an excellent source of protein and other micronutrients. Um, it's the most abundant, you know, animal um, um, class in, on the planet. And of course, uh, it's widely recognized as food in most of the world's countries. But, uh, but of course, as Canadians who at the time were looking at this, we were a little bit concerned because, you know, this is not exactly food. We, we didn't grow up looking at insects as a food. We actually looked up, grew up looking at it in a very different way as, as the opposite of a food, as a pest, as a nuisance, something that destroys crops, 
is a disease vector and so on. But it took a little bit of research for us to begin to appreciate that not all insects are created equal. So while it's true that you know 90 plus percent of insect species may be harmful to people, ecology or, or, or in some other combination, there is a very significant class of insects that are edible and that are actually incredibly nutritious and that are incredibly sustainable to produce. Um, and so we figured if we can come up with a way to actually farm insects in a modular way, and if we can leverage you know, climate controlled indoor ag, um, we could develop what could be really the densest protein production system on the planet. Uh, and we could not just address the acute problems of food insecurity, which is important, but we can go a click above that and start thinking about food sovereignty and, and how could you end up you know, going to countries that are landlocked, that don't have access to rich agricultural land and resources to nevertheless be able to have the ability to produce sufficient protein to feed their own populations without having to rely on imports. And so to your very first question, you know, what, what, what is the delta between one year ago and today when we were supposed to have this conversation? I honestly think like the pandemic has in many ways accelerated much of the things and the trends that we have been talking about for years and honestly has been a much more profound megaphone for the and, and, a, and a highlighter of the real problems affecting our planet than probably all of our combined you know PR efforts and that's because we all saw last year first of all the you know the, the contraction of our of our global supply chain and how vulnerable it was you saw you know thousands of gallons of milk getting dumped animals being culled etc because just the supply chain overnight was completely in disarray um, at the same time that you were seeing grocery store shelves completely empty and people panic buying everything. And all of a sudden companies that were, that were kind of on their way down, like, you know, um, Kraft, Heinz, et cetera, and all these like household brands that for years had been kind of losing their, 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 um, their mojo, all of a sudden became these stable anchors and households and people were going back and buying. That was the initial reaction. People were just bought panic buying, very worried, not sure what's going to happen next, you know, and therefore people didn't really think about the luxury of choosing what is sustainable, what is better for their body, what is better for the environment necessarily. But three months later, as we all started to grapple with the fact that this thing is a marathon and not a sprint, as we all realize, okay, we need to, we don't need to actually buy like three freezers full of food because actually we still have food and the world's okay. Um, that's when consumers started to really sit back and, and now reflect a little bit more thoughtfully about the fact that, okay, well, what, what's going on in the world today? And I think historically, when it comes to consumer sentiments around sustainability and food, you have people who are reactive and people who are proactive, you know, so the, the first camp are people who, you know, they care about the planet in very abstract terms, but they're not really keen to change their behaviors necessarily to do so. They, they'll do some things. Whereas you have another group, which is the more sort of proactive consumer that is actively looking at ways to change the way they live, the way they dress, the way they drive, the way they, and they're willing to dramatically modify behaviors. And in some cases do so with a little bit of a sacrifice. You know, your switching cost might be high and the taste might not be as great and the convenience might not be as available, but you feel very good about the decision you're making. What we've seen over time is that, you know, initially the, the pandemic got more and more people alarmed about the state of the world. And so you had a lot of reactive um, sentimentality towards environmental change. But that has over time shifted to more and more people converting now to proactive consumers where you're thinking, OK, gosh, this was so bad. And even if we accept that climate change has only played a small percentage of what we now are experiencing globally, this is meaningful enough and serious enough that that I need to think about this more as a lifestyle rather than as a, you know, something I check off of my list. So we are now seeing what I think is going to be a really lasting consumer behavioral shift and honestly an acceleration of that that likely wouldn't have occurred over the last year if it wasn't precisely for this external stimulus that has forced all of us to have to radically rethink our food supply chains, our education systems, you know, all of it. I wonder if you could um, tell us a couple of insect-based products that consumers might be able to find. Yeah, for sure. So um, one thing that's really interesting that we also started doing is we now partner with um, with companies that are uh, or in retailers that are looking to to launch products on a private label basis. So you know, as one company that is predominantly an ingredient company, so Aspire, we we excel in the large-scale manufacturing and production of insect protein ingredients. Um, and 
uh, and then of course we, we can certify to companies and CPG brands, you know, different ways in which they can use those ingredients. But our plan isn't necessarily to launch, you know, a hundred different SKUs in, a, in 10 different parts of the grocery store. But if we can partner with Loblaws, which we did, who's interested in launching, you know, a new SKU because a year and a half ago, they did a protein powder from crickets. And then this year they decided they want to launch a protein bar. And we're in discussions about launching another exciting product in a very different part of the grocery store. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to kind of use this ingredient as a platform to reach the consumer in so many different familiar product formats. Uh, because, you know, for some people, the excitement and intrigue around trying insects might be there, but they just don't like eating protein bars. And, you know, that's not really their, their go-to snack. So the idea is to try to take this ingredient and normalize it in as many familiar foods as possible so more and more people can enjoy it. Got you. Liz, um, I wonder if you could tell us about EnviroFlight and your sort of experience during the, the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I will echo a lot of the comments that Mohammed and Carrie have made. Um, we focus at EnviroFlight on raising black soldier fly larvae to create high value protein and energy ingredients for the animal uh, ingredient needs. So we feed the animals that feed people or feed your, your valuable pets. Um, but I think we, we started this journey along very similar lines as many of the other alternative protein companies, which was to create value from raw material streams that maybe had less value in other industries, or frankly, we're going to go to the landfill and create greenhouse gases and, and waste streams that were not viable or sustainable. Um, and we're really excited to play a part of that, uh, be a part of that alternative protein industry. I think you made a point at the beginning, Tom, that's really, um, um, it, it makes it very easy to do my job. And that is the natural evolution of, of insect consumption by animals. So my, my former life, I was a comparative nutritionist and I fed everything from earthworms to elephants. And I will tell you, there's not one animal that I can speak to that does need insects as part of its natural physiology, including humans. Um, and so I think the, the alternative protein world benefits from insects because obviously all the sustainability reasons and upcycling of raw materials, but also because this is a natural part of animal and human diets. Um, and we've seen this trend uh, explode, I think, in the last year with the pandemic as people have been homebound and focus more on their backyard garden and frankly on backyard chickens and goats and pigs and things like that to raise their own food. I mean, we've seen tremendous growth in the industry for finding more natural food items to feed to those animals who are going to produce meat, milk, or eggs that are going to end up in your family's household. Um, so I think, I think it's a, a trend that, we, that it sounds like everybody's talking to is this kind of uh, increased focus on sustainability and natural food items going into the household, whether that's directly into your mouth from a, a CPG product or if that's going to an animal that's going to um, be part of your diet or frankly in your dog's food bowl. And the other thing that we really noticed in the last year is an increased focus on a local or regional supply chain. Um, and I think we, we all notice this with the grocery store that the shelves being empty, but I think that really speaks to some of these industries and the value they provide because we really do focus on local supply chains and being able to provide things in, in, our, in our region and not being, you know, putting something on a, a container that's gonna spend six weeks on the water to reach its end consumer. And I think we're all realizing now what value that provides that maybe wasn't quite as um, recognized prior to the pandemic. So it's a really exciting time, I think, to be in the alternative protein industry um, because of all of these reasons. And I think to the points that have already been made, the pandemic has just highlighted the need for sustainable local opportunities to feed our animals and ourselves. You know, one thing, you know, so I'm a, a writer who, focuses on the food system. And I, I just, um, in 2020, published a book called Perilous Bounty that looks at the way, you know, basically there's a big section on the, the corn and soybean agriculture that's sort of the center of U.S. agriculture that drives the meat system. And um, I sort of take the reader back away from their meat and, and, and show what what the sort of environmental problems with the way that we grow corn and soybeans is. And so what it makes, I wanna, I'm thinking about each one of the products I've heard about um, today. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, um, I always wanna know um, what the feedstock is, um, whether you're growing kelp in the ocean, 
um, that kelp is, um, you know, is somehow interacting with this ecosystem and consuming something and, and putting something out. Um, and the same with insects. Um, insects are, you know, don't magically grow. They, they eat stuff um, and that's how they grow. So I wonder if you guys, um, Carrie, starting with Carrie, could talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what it takes to grow your product um, and how, what does it look like as it scales up? Sure. I mean, it's interesting I um, to think about, we actually have a nursery um, that we, because of the production facility is only out for part of the year and then it turns into a, you know, kelp production facility where we're blanching kelp, et cetera. Um, but we have found um, that we grow the seeds in a lab to get to a certain point, you know, so they just need photosynthesis. So it's, you know, light and, and then those kinds of things, but that there is something really special to choosing what we can sort of consider are the Harvard graduates of kelp versus the, you know, maybe the, the less, the, the, the less effective kelp strains. And then we've actually gone to Asia, our, our team has gone to Asia to actually study um, the kelp strains and the different um, species of seaweed. So kelp is one species, we're actually looking at other species that might actually grow well in our geography to really produce the most viable kelp. And then when we work with the farmers who are you know, formerly or also in the off season lobster fishermen to learn actually what areas of the ocean are actually best. Um, and to think about some of the things that you wouldn't expect Expect, like one of the farmers lost a crop because a dock got set free and like took out that whole you know kelp farm for the for the season and that literally in different microclimates you know in the bay versus you know in the fresh you know in the wild ocean etc you know there's just different growing conditions and so we have to predict each year how long do we think the kelp is going to grow is this region suitable for that and in fact because we're just in for the season our kelp is actually some of the kelp is actually cleaner and prettier. It can actually be used in different contexts. So if you're at a restaurant, you're gonna wrap a piece of fish in kelp, you want a really good looking one, not one that was sitting on the bottom that had snails climbing on it and got cut up, et cetera. So there's all these like interesting idiosyncrasies you have to think about, about where's the kelp gonna go, which are actually the best strains, which are the best species outside of kelp. We have a skinny kelp and we, that we use for some foods and we have a broader leafed kelp for other things. Um, so, you know, there's all these nuances about understanding the biology um, of the species that, that we're learning. What's fun is the ecosystem impacts, like I, I alluded to before, which is that the kelp is actually, as a plant, much like, you know, the trees in our ecosystem are really helpful with carbon dioxide and oxygen. In the ocean, the same thing is happening. And so um, there are actually companies and, and researchers that are actually planting or uh, are actually growing shellfish below kelp farms in order to actually have plumper shellfish, et cetera, that have harder, you know, shells and plumper insides because the, the water around them is actually better. So it's one of those things where the, this, the system is self-reinforcing. Uh, but, but plants are particularly interesting in that they have so few external requirements. You know, it's like nitrogen, you know, water, light are kind of like the inputs um, in addition to finding these right seeds. And we'll be doing more work around, you know, strain selection and interbreeding and, and things like that to really get the most robust, healthiest kelp that provides the nutrients that you're talking about as a superfood, but also make them continue to be viable. And, you know, right now we're just in this one environment in Maine, but you can imagine if we're going to try to feed the country with this over time, you know, we may need to look at other, you know, ecosystems, whether we go up the coast in the cold waters or we look at other coasts. Um, and we're in the early stages of that but as an industry. This is, uh, you know, the first really big viable US-based kelp um, or seaweed production entity. Most of the seaweed we get in this country is from uh, overseas. And frankly, it's a lot of it's been grown in toxic waters and dehydrated and then gets rehydrated here and often dyed green. Um, and we don't know the source of the water it was in. And so we're really looking to, you know, domestic production to be able to have more control over the inputs. Because if you think, if what you think you're eating is healthy, but it grew in a toxic environment, you're, you know, you might be at cross purposes. Got you. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think to answer your question around feedstock, um, you know, maybe a, a quick word on, on, on insects and their feed conversion efficiency. And I think this is true as much for crickets. Um, and, and I mean, maybe Liz can comment on the specifics with black soldier flies. But basically, you know, when it comes to food production and, and protein production from animals in general, your rate limiting step is actually the animal itself, right? Like we've in, in enormously innovated around the supply chains, both upstream and downstream of the animals in terms of either getting feed to the animal or, you know, processing the animal into fi finished products. But in the end of the day, you know, 
each of these animals is a bioreactor and its ability to convert feed into protein biomass is limited to its biology. And in the case of, you know, much more complex and, and um, you know, evolved organisms like, you know, cows and pigs and chickens even, you have a much lower percentage of the feed that converts to protein. Um, and it's not so much because the animal is wasteful, it's just because that feed needs to support so many different functions in that animal that by the time the animal's basic functions are met, only a little bit of it is left to be converted to muscle mass. With, um, with insects, there's such a simple organism um, that, that, that virtually everything they eat becomes their biomass. And so the old adage of you are what you eat could not possibly be more true with insects, right? Where with crickets, for example, in the published literature, unlike cows where the feed conversion ratio is about eight to one, meaning eight pounds of feed producing about one pound of, of meat, uh, with, you know, with pigs, that's about five to one. With chickens, it's about two to one. And that's, by the way, after 50 years of very intensive production, where that feed conversion efficiency used to be closer to three and four to one. Um, with crickets, it's 1.3 to one. So that produces two really interesting things. The first is, as we described, it's very efficient. You need less land, water, and energy and inputs in, in overall. Um, and I'll get to the feedstock source specifically in a second. But the second interesting thing is that they are what they eat. So if you feed your crickets, for example, a feed that is rich in alfalfa or certain types of, you know, leafy greens or what have you, they actually taste like that. So a few years back, we partnered with Saison in San Francisco, where the chef actually gave us a regimentation of a diet to feed to the crickets so that by the time we harvest them, they actually have the flavoring of those specific types of herbs. Um, and that just takes advantage of that conversion efficiency. Now, when we first started, you have to understand like, you know, and this is, I mean, Carrie, you're sort of talking about this in the kelp world, how it's still like the first inning, like you're, you're really figuring out how to scale this up and you don't really have a lot of great analogs because where it is being done right now, it's not really being done to the degree you would want it to be done or the same ethics or the same standards, whatever, insert, you know, some criteria here that you have to now pioneer because you don't really have a precedent that, that is reliable that you could use. So for us, when we first started, that was true with crickets. Um, you know, there was, just to be clear, we weren't the first in the world to think of or even execute cricket farming. Cricket farming has been around since the 1940s, um, you know, to predominantly uh, serve the fish tackle and even live reptile feed space. But what we realized was um, it makes sense for us to, from the perspective of trying to, um, you know, farm at scale, Think of it as an experiment. If you have too many variables at once, it's very difficult to come at the end of the month when you see an increase or a decrease in yield to attribute that to any one variable because you just have way too many confounding variables creating noise. So what we wanted to do from the get-go was to actually fix and isolate specific variables and hold them constant so that we can work on the specific variables of interest that we knew had the greatest impact on change. So some of the things we decided to hold constant in the beginning were things like feed. So rather than develop or engineer a feed for crickets or start you know, experimenting with different waste streams, et cetera, we actually decided to use an off the shelf chicken, boiler chicken feed for two reasons. One, so that we can have an apples to apples comparison on feed conversion efficiency to the next most efficient animal source that we have in our, our food chain. Uh, and second, so that we can hold a variable constant, as I said. So the feedstock we've historically used is the combination of corn and soy. Um, organic and non-GMO, but nevertheless, it's corn and soy. Um, now, what's interesting is we know that the animal feed we're using is not designed for crickets. It's designed for starter chickens. So it has things like vitamin A, which we know our crickets don't even metabolize. So our next step in kind of when you think about our feed optimization journey, our next step is what you can call elimination. So just starting to remove items from the current feed ingredient list that we know have exactly no effect on the growth or development of the crickets, but are just sort of filler ingredients that are more expensive. The next step after that is substitution. So starting to look at, you know, brewery waste and other waste streams, whether it's pre-consumer waste or otherwise, that we can actually swap in and start using. And so you can end up in this really really exciting scenario where not only are you no longer procuring and purchasing feed, you're actually partnering with companies that are generating enormous amounts of waste and using that feedstock as food. Now, everything I'm describing, we're planning to do. This is stuff Liz and her team are already doing. So this might be a good segue to turn it over to Liz and get her to comment on how they're approaching this at EnviroFlight. Well, what I'm getting is that it's incredibly flexible that this, these are species that can 
can thrive on a variety of different stuff. Absolutely. But yeah, let's let's go to Liz. Well, I, and I, I have to say, Mohammed, I can't agree more with the strategy of fixing variables. So like Aspire, we, we've done very similar, we've taken very similar tactics. So essentially in, in our facility and many other businesses that are raising insects and, and the kelp sounds very similar, we're start, we are breeding animals, we are growing animals, we are processing animals, we are creating ingredients and potentially further processing those ingredients. And so essentially these are multiple businesses under one roof, all of which have complexities and none of which had a rule book when, when I started. Um, and so we have fixed a lot of variables. We have focused our feeding program um, around um, byproducts from the bakery industry. So you know the, the cookies and the bread products that don't make it to the grocery store shelf or make it to the grocery store shelf, but don't get sold and on distillery grains. And so we've created a very consistent feedstock uh, in part to fix that variable. So it's one less thing to be, have it, you know, be a complex um, item in our process, but also because it was very important to us as we established ourselves in this industry and we are the first in the US to commercialize that we produce a really consistent end product. Because if we wanna go tell people they can safely feed this to their animals, they need to be able to count on the fact that batch over batch, we're giving them the same raw material. Um, and so as we expand our feedstock programs, we, we have an extensive R&D program. We evaluate uh, hundreds of feedstocks um, and we ask questions about how effective are they? How economical are they? How sustainable are they? How far away are they from where we are manufacturing our animals and growing our animals? And frankly, what is the consistency and quality of the end product? Because at the end of the day, even if it's sustainable, if I can't make a safe quality ingredient it's not a viable use of that raw material and it's not a viable use of our time. Uh, black soldier fly larvae are incredibly um, flexible in their feeding programs and they can be reared on virtually anything, but those criteria for us are, are incredibly important that our customers know we're producing the highest quality and safety product. Tremendous opportunity to grow with, with producers of raw materials though in the future. Can you talk a little bit about um, the end market for the, for the larva. I, I remember a few years ago when I did my piece, it seemed like the target was the protein component of, um, you know, various livestock diets, which would, would be soybeans, but also I think, you know, there's this uh, really high, really expensive and high ecological costs component that goes especially into like young pigs and young chickens, which is um, fish meal, which is a really concentrated protein. Um, and so there's this idea that soldier flies, um, you know, way more sustainable than the fish meal industry um, could displace some of that. And can you tell us how that's going? And also maybe comment on whether pet food might be um, a, a, new, um, a new end point for your product. Yeah, so I think, um... The, the evolution of the, the market for insect ingredients and animal feed is driven by two factors. One is obviously it's nutritional value and cost. So as a feed formulator, you would be looking at how these ingredients fit into your feeding program and how that affects your bottom line. Um, and then the other piece of it is the regulation. So in the United States, there's a relatively high burden of proof of safety for an ingredient to receive regulatory approval. And so those two things have to guide the development of the market. Um, and right now, black soldier fly larvae are approved for poultry and swine in their, their high protein and whole larva form, and also for salmonid fish. Um, and then this year in January, we were excited to get tentative approval. So we're partway through the process uh, for dog food um, and for some of the oil products to be applied into poultry and swine and fish diets. So so some of the market development really follows that regulatory approval process where we've seen the highest level of interest thus far is really in the, the poultry market. So again, people who are feeding backyard chickens and they wanna know exactly where the eggs that went to their table, where, what those birds ate. Uh, and then I would say in the more ultra premium niche markets for pigs and chickens where um, again, the, the person who's feeding isn't necessarily making a decision, a bottom line decision based on the cost of insect meal relative to soybean meal, for example, but it's looking at the benefits and the sustainability to the animal and to their end consumer. Uh, there's tremendous interest in pet food, though. I mean, dogs and cats naturally eat insects. Anybody who has a dog or cat know this is true, that they are happy to go find a fly in the house and consume it. Um, and there's also some really exciting research suggesting that um, these 
these proteins, because they're novel to pet food, um, essentially become hypoallergenic and help contribute to um, diets for animals that have sensitivities, whether skin or gut sensitivities. So uh, there's tremendous interest for development of that market as well. Tom, if you don't mind, I thought I'd just jump in on something. I noticed that both Mohammed and um, Liz were talking about how uh, these animals are actually reusing food products that might not have other been otherwise been used in the in the stream and i think that's how we a lot of us think about food waste is going to the crickets or the animals etc and i'll just say that it's interesting that there's also some upcycling that happens in the human food world um, and that not all food waste is actually waste right it's food that was destined to be waste but could have been resolved. So I think some of you may be familiar with some of the brands that are taking what's considered ugly produce, you know, the stuff that maybe doesn't sell, they don't put out the apple that it's sort of misshapen, but it's a perfectly good apple. Um, we have a company called Reblend that's doing that, um, but really looking further in the chain. So there's actually food manufacturing waste. And I think about examples like if a company is making cauliflower rice, I mean, they have, you know, some of the cauliflower actually doesn't get used for the rice production or pulp from juicing, which, you know, it still has plenty of nutrients in it and frankly, all the fiber. So our company Reblend is actually taking those kinds of things like the produce that isn't appropriate for sale and the pulp from juicing, et cetera, and turning it into pre-blended smoothies. Um, and so you actually get like a little packet, like think about those flavor ice that are full of just processed colors and sugars, but instead it's actually a smoothie that doesn't require you to like chop up all the fruits and vegetables yourself, but actually get access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And I think there's probably, there's so many opportunities in our food system where um, there's a byproduct that actually still has plenty of value in it that can actually go back into human food or it can go to these other sources that are gonna create really high impact proteins out of it, et cetera. And so we've got to figure out ways to connect these pieces of the supply chain because actually those things, not only are they wasted that food, but it actually, I think Liz mentioned some of it actually creates greenhouse gases and actually becomes more destructive. Um, and yet it could have gone you know, straight into something else. And so one of the opportunities is to figure out how to connect these different entities uh, more in a more streamlined fashion to actually create a more productive uh, you know, food system than maybe nature you know, does on its own. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious about, um, generally speaking, you know, obviously people in, in the United States drink a whole lot of beer. I, you know, we're, we have high beer consumption. What, what percentage of the brewery waste would you guys estimate is now just going into the landfill? Any, any ideas about that? I feel like if my business partner were here, she would have that answer because her she and her husband actually also have a brewery. Uh, we did though um, talk to, I don't know the answer on the numbers point of view, but I will say that I even know another example of a food company that was actually taking um, brewery um, waste and actually turning some of the byproducts of that into flowers and things that were really high protein. Um, so there's some, you know, conversations happening there, but I think um, it's so early, right? These are like, you know, I think to both Liz oh, yeah. and Muhammad, points all of these projects that we're talking about are still very much like siloed experience experiments as opposed to at scale of like how we feed america so i think it just means lots of opportunity yeah and and that, that's sort of what i was getting at it's like i feel like each one of the projects that we've heard about are either exploring a niche that has existed like an ecological an ecological niche that can produce sustainable food and feed products that has existed for a long time that's been ignored and i think Kelp is a great example of that. And or finding these niches like, why are we putting this brewery waste into the landfill instead of feeding it to soldier flies that can then displace some other product that we're growing um, in a destructive way. And so I wonder if we could close by each of you sort of giving um, takeaways for the audience and just um, putting your project into context of this, this struggle that we're all in, this, this necessity, this sort of, I would say even emergency that we are all experiencing to turn our food system in a more resilient, robust, climate-friendly direction. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll start with you, Liz. So um, I guess, you know, my, my background is agriculture, and I think this is a really exciting time to be part of U.S. agriculture. I think the emphasis on sustainability is incredibly exciting, and I look at what we do as playing a really fundamental role in helping improve sustainability of agriculture in the U.S. in a circular manner, whether that's us taking byproducts and 
upcycling them to higher value ingredients and then feeding them to your dog or cat and promoting having some health benefits or frankly feeding them to pigs and chickens to help make the the animal livestock industry have more sustainable options for providing the protein that's needed to grow the meat milk and eggs that we consume on a regular basis so um, I think uh, at Enviroflight, we're just we're we're really excited to be part of that development uh, of more sustainable agriculture, and frankly, just to see where the road takes us. Um, we just ex- announced an expansion. We're going to double in size in the next year, and and this is in part because of this increased demand um, for these types of products. Um, so, just very excited to be part of the industry and see where it goes. Yeah, and you know when I'm when I think about the idea of insects going into the pet stream. I think about how the pet food stream now relies really heavily on the sort of giant US meat industry and all the sort of waste that it produces. That, that's what ends up, um, you know, sort of the, the scraps of the industry are what ends up going into pet food. And if we take seriously the idea that we need to ramp down meat production, that we need to, um, to limit it, we need to eat less meat and you know, just produce less of it in general, then that means less scraps for the pet food industry and we will need a cleaner, healthier alternatives. And it sounds like insects could be one of those, one of those things like, you know, there's no shortage of um, slaughterhouse waste right now, but if we actually get a sane policy in place, there will be a shortage of slaughterhouse waste. And that's where I think um, your sort of uh, insect based um, pet foods could really come into come into play. Yeah, we, we think we could provide a really nice alternative to other protein sources. And I will say, frankly, there's a lot of premium grade protein that goes into pet food. Um, and that's what the consumer has demanded. A lot of that protein could be diverted to the human food chain. Um, and so finding ways to supplement or augment the need for these animals, they're carnivores, they need protein in their diet. But if we can provide something that can help divert other proteins to other other groups and, and get maybe the premium proteins into the human food chain and, and offer alternatives for some of these other animal species, we're, we're excited to do so. Excellent. So I guess going back to your question, Tom, just about sort of some parting thoughts. I, I, I don't think we know what the audience is today, given that we're in a virtual uh, environment. But I, because I'm a VC sparklist at the early stage, I think about where all the new innovations are coming from and the new ideas and just what kind of want to encourage um, people who have those kind of ideas to get involved in the ecosystem, because I think there's a lot of receptivity for it now, right? So we are investors in, you know, this sector, including going upstream into the supply chain and ag tech. And we keep meeting more and more investors that are really looking at this, whether they have an explicit impact, you know, imperative in their fund thesis, or just because they see the business viability of these alternatives. And we're also seeing the same thing happening at the corporate level. So a lot of the big food companies who have done things the traditional way, who we might frankly think of negatively if we're, you know, sort of like-minded around sustainability, are actually realizing that they have to evolve and are building initiatives to invest in these new um, ideas, et cetera, and are frankly potential acquirers of these technologies. So there's a lot now of um, incubators and accelerators and early stage kind of support to help these new kinds of, you know, innovations off the ground, whether they're, you know, science-based or tech-based or just new approaches, new business models. Um, and so I don't have a, like a list of resources, but I feel like sitting here like that ought to be something that I start producing. Um, but I'm happy to be a resource if, you know, um, you know, if you're a woman-led company at the seed stage, you might be a fit for us, but even if you're not, I might be able to help direct you um, to some resources that'll help get these new ideas off the ground. We want to be you know, fostering all kinds of these new experiments um, to help diversify the, the choices. Mohammed? Um, yeah, I, I know, I think, I think a very big, um, you know, lesson we've learned also over the years is to really make sure you do your homework on understanding and following the footprint. Um, number one, I think it's very easy for us to point at some of the largest companies in the world to Carrie's point and just, you know, make a, a bad example out of them. But the irony is most startups want scale. And once you get to scale, you're inevitably going to be that big, bad company that's going to be doing one or more things that are less than ideal. Um, And so, you know, it might be a competitive advantage today, but that's not really a sustained long-term differentiating advantage. 
more importantly, you really have to be fair and, and honest in terms of your, your comparisons also, right? So again, it's easy to take like crickets and compare them to cows because cows will just make look anything look flattering, but that's not really very honest to the end consumer. You have to be, you have to be very clear and, and honest about, you know, what is good and also what, what are some of the things you're still tweaking because you're a startup and you don't have all the answers, you know, quite yet. Um, and then I think finally, it's also, you know, important to focus on radical game changing innovation rather than like hyper incremental innovation. Like I can't tell you how nourishing to my soul it has been. And I hate to say this, that I actually didn't go to, um, you know, uh, one of the, I'm not going to name it, but like one of the largest food shows in North America that happens to happen in California annually last year, because I just remember last year was the first time I went there and I thought, oh my God, like this is, this is turning into a nightmare. Like every other stand is someone who's like, here's a new water with caffeine in it. And here's a water with caffeine plus sugar in it. And here's a water with caffeine plus sugar plus like a little bit of chocolate sauce. Like, what is this? Uh, like, what's, what problem is this really solving, right? Um, so I think, I think going back to the first principles of be authentic about the problem you're trying to solve and then solve it authentically. Right. In other words, like if you come across, if you if your solution ends up proving to be, you know, lackluster or not as exciting. I remember I learned so much from um, Anne, uh, um, uh, Anne Carlson in our space, who's, you know, pioneered one of the. Uh, so so Carrie, that, that's a great women led um, startup. I don't know if it's early stage yet, but or, or at this point, I think they, they're a little bit you know, past that. But uh, Jiminy, so they're, they're a CPG consumer brand. Um, they initially started looking at, you know, treats for dogs and now have, have, have expanded to doing just general dog and, and eventually cat food. Um, and I remember like at conferences, Anne would stand up there and say, by the way, like on a, on a per capita basis, dogs and cats are now increasingly driving more greenhouse gas emissions, arguably than their owners, because unlike you and I, like every food, I, every meal I have isn't like a concentrated bowl of meat, right? It's, it's a combination of stuff with meat being maybe one of the items. Um, and then import, importantly, and this is the irony I think Liz was describing, that because now millennial pet parents understandably and even virtuously want to feed their pets the same quality fee, food that they're eating themselves, well, all of a sudden, no one wants the food scraps to go to their dogs and cats. You want them to have like the center of plate prime cuts of meat. And then now all of a sudden they're contributing ironically way more to, and, 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 it's, the, and it's ironically the pet parents who are very environmentally conscious that are doing this, right? So, and it reminds me back, at, you know, back at what happened in the eighties and nineties with quinoa in Bolivia and Peru, right? Where you had this huge, huge, huge spike in interest in quinoa by predominantly vegetarians and vegans across North America and Europe. And then all of a sudden this, this, this product was being produced at such high levels in these few countries that although it did very, it, it resulted in great outcomes for the farmers because now they were exporting quinoa more than ever before. It also caused a major problem for people locally because all of a sudden they couldn't actually afford the very quinoa that had been a staple in their, in their communities all, all this time. So it's important to really think about not just your initial motives being great, but like the consequences of your actions and the impacts they can have and then how to solve for those. Understanding that there really is no, you know, it's, it's, it's that, that, that law of, of uh, uh, um, I think it was one of the Newtonian laws, right? Where for every action, there's an, an, an equal and opposite reaction in magnitude, right? So everything you do, there's gonna be some sort of counterbalance to it. And it's important to be fair and, and honest about that balance sheet, not just with your consumers, but most importantly to yourselves and to your employees and to give yourself a break and understand that you're not going to solve it all at once, but, but at least be a part of the solution and be constantly getting better every day. Well, listen, that was some fantastic real talk to end this, I think, extremely interesting panel. Um, I learned a lot from you guys. Um, I'm not someone who is generally super easily sort of flamoxed by the latest and greatest new technology. Um, but what you guys are doing is um, really impressive, really interesting um, uses of, you know, ideas that have been around for as, you know, the entire human history and bringing them into this, you know, 21st century Western context. And I, th I think in a way that can be really helpful. So thank you so much for, for taking the time and, you um, Thank you, South by Southwest, for, for having us. Um, what a fantastic panel.